And I do have a third, and that is Sharif Bassioni. Um, right. I was very privileged this year to have been asked by a major publisher to help put together a book of essays in Sharif's honor. It's called The Theory and Practice of International Criminal Law, Essays in Honor of Sharif Bassioni. And just to, to read what it says on the back of the book, which sort of captures the essence of Sharif, it says, Professor Bassioni is often referred to as the father of international criminal law. His writings, diplomatic initiatives, field work, and even litigation have made an unparalleled contribution to the emergence of international criminal law as a distinct discipline within the field of international law. This book contains 15 scholarly essays written by leading experts from around the world about the theory and practice of modern international criminal law with a focus on Sharif Bassioni's unique legacy in this important area. Sharif, if you don't know, has dedicated his life to making justice create peace, which is why the saying up here, if you want peace, work for justice, is always thought of in the same breath as the name Sharif Bassioni. He helped draft the torture convention. He helped uh, draft the International Criminal Court Statute along with several of the experts in this room. He was the chairman of the committee of experts that searched through the evidence and found that genocide had been committed in the former Yugoslavia and insisted that there be an international criminal tribunal and thereby triggered a new era of accountability, replacing the era of the years gone by of impunity. And we are so lucky that Sharif has come year after year to our conferences to add luster to them. And today he is giving our keynote speech about the historical evolution of the crime of aggression. Please join me in welcoming Sharif Bassioni. Well, thank you so much, Michael, for your kind words and, and for the book that you and Leila uh, worked on and uh, uh, produced as a fest shrift. I think it was for my 70th uh, uh, anniversary uh, uh, a year ago, and, and I'm glad to uh, receive it here on this occasion. Uh, it's a great honor to, to be with you. Uh, we have heard uh, uh, from Henry and, and, and Ben. Um, uh, one presentation, Henry gave us uh, a significant insight into the legal historical background, and uh, Ben's presentation sort of uh, uh, uplifted our spirits and, and raised our consciousness level. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate Larry on the award that he received and also to uh, say hello to Ben Schiff, who wrote a marvelous book on the International Criminal Court as well, uh, based on a lot of uh, very uh, uh, useful uh, empirical research. I'm really almost left with... Um, just a few observations and thoughts that may be somewhat eclectic uh, in, in the way uh, I'm going to present them to you. Uh, and the first thought I have is that in, in legal matters, uh, nothing is really what it appears to be, uh, or very seldom anyway. And uh, sometimes we have the impression that because we have a legal precept or uh, a particular norm that that necessarily means that this precept or norm is going to be applied and that it's going to be applied in a consistent manner. That is very seldom the case as the history of law reveals throughout times. And the reason for that is, is that what we, what we believe is international law uh, or the regulation of international relations uh, at various levels uh, is strongly influenced by three factors. Uh, the first factor being, of course, state interests. The second factor, which is more emerging in recent times, but we can find traces of it going back for several centuries, um, what I would call commonly shared values. 
Uh, this is particularly evident, for example, in the evolution of the concept of the just war, uh, which not only emerged from Roman law doctrine, uh, but was strongly influenced by uh, certain Greek philosophical ethical foundations, as well as uh, strongly influenced by uh, Catholic doctrine. Um, so, in a sense, you have in the notion of the just war um, a fusion or a confluence um, of historical practices of the Roman Empire uh, coupled with Greek philosophical concepts of ethics um, and Catholic conceptions of Christian morality. Um, but what you also see is that this did not necessarily mean that the recognition of a concept such as that of just war uh, applied uh, and certainly uh, applied in a consistent manner. This was not the case. The third, I would say, is, is falls in a category that you can call a, a sort of a grab bag of uh, uh, contingency factors arising out of realities. Um, I don't know what better word to make of it. Um, but what happens very frequently is um, that in their relations, states are very much influenced by certain contingent factors which arise out of a particular contemporary reality. Um, let me suggest to you that while aggression has not fallen into desuetude as a practice, uh, the enforcement of aggression certainly has. Um, and it is very difficult to speak of aggression either in a normative sense, particularly in a normative criminal sense, or as something which is the product of customary international practice. It is not part of customary international practice, and it does leave a great deal to be desired from the normative perspective. Uh, Henry mentioned the list of things that, uh, that Telford Taylor uh, raised at the time, and that many others also raised when you're dealing with international criminal responsibility. It is much easier to deal with the concept of aggression from the perspective of, if you will, the civil responsibility of states. But when you address it from criminal responsibility perspective, you really shift entirely in methodology. Uh, the methodology of criminal law is radically different from the methodology of international law. And yes, it is a very important principle uh, uh, the principle of, of uh, legality or principles of legality of, of no uh, crime without, uh, without law and no punishment without law. This has been hard fought and hard won uh, simply because the history of tyrannical regimes have shown that the manipulation of criminal law and its powers have, have invariably taken these forms and so what we have seen is the history of, of criminal law, in a sense, presenting itself as criminal law, doctrine, and method, but really a protection of human rights uh, and somewhat of an insurance against excessive powers have established these rules, which certainly uh, uh, in, 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 uh, either in the common law or in the uh, civilist legal systems have existed for many years with a little more rigidity in the Germanic legal systems and those that followed them. So you will find the principles of legality in all legal systems with some differences in applications so that whereas in the common law we may have uh, a greater latitude with the principle of analogy uh, and the same with Islamic law, uh, you're not going to find the possibility of applying the system of analogy uh, in, in the Germanic system and certainly not in the civilist system uh, deriving from Roman law but also strongly influenced by uh, French uh, criminal law in the 1800s. So 
having said that, what you have is a very difficult fit uh, to try to include under the doctrine of international criminal responsibility and more particularly under the doctrine of domestic criminal responsibility that of those who make decisions to, in effect, engage in war, carry out war, or facilitate war. Bear in mind that the overall structure of international criminal law, uh, particularly uh, as, as embodied in the statute of the ICC, places its first emphasis on domestic legal systems, uh, using the doctrine of complementarity by saying basically that international institutions are there to fill the gap. International institutions are there to be resorted to when national legal systems are unable or unwilling to carry out their responsibilities for whatever reasons they may be. Some of them may be perfectly valid, legitimate reasons, um, whether the situation, contemporary situation in Uganda permitted the government of Uganda to carry out its own investigations or whether it was more appropriate to refer the matter to uh, uh, the ICC in order to be able to have the ICC carry it out. But th the notion of complementarity and primacy of national legal systems uh, is there. Uh, and if that is the case, then we have to think in terms of aggression, not by analogy to a concept of international law civil responsibility, uh, uh, i.e. Uh, uh, wrongful uh, uh, conduct uh, by a state in light of uh, the whole historic development and customary international practice of the principles of state responsibility, but how does it fit? in terms of comparative criminal law uh, as a principle of domestic criminal responsibility. And, and there really is a very significant uh, uh, hurdle uh, to be overcome. It's not only a question of method, uh, but it's also a question of content. Uh, the content requiring the specificity uh, in the definition. And I'm sure that if you sort of simply take the question of what is the mental element that is going to be required to be proven uh, that a head of state intended either by specific intent or general intent to uh, commit an armed attack upon another state when that head of state was totally convinced beyond his or her moral certainty that the action was done as a way of preemptive self-defense, but that in reality that head of state exceeded uh, that authority or based it on an erroneous judgment. Allow me to raise the simple example of information reaching um, the, the desk of a president of, uh, of, of the United States, as in the case of Iraq, um, and that this evidence, assuming that this evidence is not fabricated, uh, and assuming that this evidence is not presented purposely as a piece of fabricated evidence to deceive the public, but let's assume that, that the evidence is, is, is in good faith, and the evidence indicates that uh, there is a country that has the potential of using weapons of mass destruction which could have a serious deleterious and harmful effect upon one's own country. Um, how much are you going to require that head of state to assume the risk of being victimized by such a potential attack before saying after the fact? that that judgment to do preemptive self-defense was an erroneous judgment. What I'm saying is that you do have a lot of instances where you have a judgmental factor at play and assuming good faith uh, and assuming reasonableness, uh, it is very difficult to criminalize the lack of good judgment. Uh, it is also very difficult to weigh the circumstances that a decision maker will have to undergo. Um, as you go down, if you will, from the decision maker, again, as, as Henry mentioned in reference to, to Telford Taylor, 
Um, assume that you go down from the head of state to Corporal Ferens, who is ordered to march across the border. Um, at what point in time do you say, this is the cutoff point, um, this is a crime that is limited to decision makers or to senior executors? Um, but even as you go down the, the, the ladder from uh, the head of state or senior decision makers down, at, at what point in time do you shift from general intent to specific intent? Bear in mind that there is a tendency to require a specific intent of those higher up in the chain, whereas logically I would completely invert the process. And I would assume that those higher up in the chain of command, because of the assumption that they have access to information, knowledge, and advice, are more likely to be those who will be able to avoid by some device of plausible deniability, uh, the specificity of the intent. And therefore, you would want to have general intent for the decision maker because of the decision maker and the senior executor's access to information, knowledge, facts, etc. Whereas as you go down uh, to, uh, for example, in, in East Germany, the situation of the guards who have an order to shoot people who are trying to go over the wall. Uh, if you're going to charge them with genocide or crimes against humanity, you had better find that there is a specific intent there uh, because obviously uh, the, the impact of, of knowledge and facts on both of these categories of perpetrators is going to be significantly different. So the method, uh, uh, the, the legal method, uh, and, uh, and here I'm thinking more in terms of the Germanic approach to legal method and the, 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 the civilist system of legal method is going to have a very significant impact on how you conceptualize the crime, how you define it, and ultimately how you apply it. There is still a great deal of lack of clarity as to that. Um, another observation I would like to bring to your attention is that most military experts um, uh, will we'll probably agree that uh, the history of warfare, at least I'm referring to uh, people like uh, Jeffrey Best and, and other um, military theoreticians, uh, the history of warfare has now entered into what many call the fourth generation of war. And the fourth generation of war, unlike prior generations, is quite different. Um, remember that the drafting of the Charter uh, in, of the United Nations in 1945 was predicated to a large extent on September 1st, 1939. The German troops are lined on the border. An order is given, they cross the border. That experience is anchored in World War I. The cavalry is lined up it crosses the border. It is much neater, much easier to address an issue of an armed attack when you are dealing with this kind of warfare. It is totally different when you are dealing with the fourth generation warfare in which, and I'll just use that as an example, you have an organization like Al-Qaeda uh, with a series of networks throughout the world um, highly uncoordinated um, and uh, without any uh, possibility of predicting uh, the type of attack they will engage in uh, with the assurance, the assurance, I say that, that they will use civilian targets. There is no way that they can engage in any type of conflict with this asymmetry of power without resorting to a violation of what has heretofore been considered uh, the law of armed conflict or international humanitarian law. Uh, th there is no, nothing for them to gain. Um, th th there is no inducement for them, uh, even looking at the present legal basis, there's no inducement for them to comply with these requirements. 
in a conflict of a non-international character or in a purely internal conflict. Yes, there is the general aspirations of common Article 3 and, and, and the little bit of, uh, of, of what we consider uh, being part of Protocol 2, which is part of customary international law, but these are not considered lawful combatants. They do not receive POW status. They really have no particular incentive. But the, the, the structure of these military organizations is a completely and totally different structure from the traditional military organizations. So all of the assumptions that exist with respect to military organizations totally disappear in the, the, the structure of these organizations engaged in these new conflicts. Um, for example, in, in a traditional structure, you're relying on the existence of an organizational structure with a command and control system. Uh, you do not have that. Uh, in these other uh, military groups. Uh, number two, um, you, you, you don't have an obligation uh, on those who are in a position of command to enforce the law of armed conflict and discipline on their subordinate. And number three, maybe quite important, is that in, in military traditions, there is a notion of duty and honor that is very important as part of this organizational structure. That concept is entirely different in the non-state actor groups that engage in the type of violence that we see uh, in the fourth generation of war. So you don't have any incentives from the law or on the part of the law you don't have any realistic reason why you should abide by these rules of law because of the asymmetry of power. And the only way that you can really impact upon your opponent uh, is by engaging in these types of unconventional methods of war which commit serious violations against civilians and, and other otherwise prohibited target. Uh, and you also have a completely different culture uh, among the combatants who engage in that. So if you look at that and you say, well, in what way will uh, this new culture of war and these new practices of war in the fourth generation of warfare going to impact on the concept of aggression? This is not a situation where you're going to have the cavalry line up and cross a border. Uh, if you're going to find something happening in Afghanistan, uh, responses by whether it's American, British, or, or other troops willing to join in is going to have to be by special forces engaging in the type of guerrilla tactics that the Taliban's or Al-Qaeda engage in. There is no way that you can address that in terms of a conventional war. Um, if you have a connection between uh, groups like uh, the FARC uh, trafficking in drugs and certain manifestations of terrorism in Colombia, uh, the activities of, of the U.S. military special forces uh, and others uh, in connection with the Colombian forces are not going to take the traditional military form. How then can you decide whether or not in the use of military forces by the U.S. in Colombia or in Afghanistan, this may or may not constitute aggression. Uh, at what point in time does the fact that Al-Qaeda or the Taliban seek refuge in uh, the mountains and there is an arbitrary line called the boundary line uh, in the mountain that puts them on the Pakistan side, at what point in time does the sending of a drone after uh, these combatants constitute an act of aggression? Uh, what I'm suggesting to you is that in addition to the many um, historically demonstrated reasons why governments are reluctant to give up uh, their ability to use force, either in a legitimate perception of what they believe to be their national defense, or for other particular reasons. Um, this this uh, giant Gulliver uh, 
of, of national, uh, if you will, e exclusivity and exceptionalism is not going to be easily tamed. Um, and I think that we have to look at it uh, in a way, um, and I'm not going to use the word realistic, but in a way that is grounded in <coughs> historic experience. There are some limits that we can develop. And the question is, yesterday at the reception, Elizabeth Wilmhurst and I were talking, and uh, we came to the conclusion, well, if, if the goal, and, and it's important to identify what the goal is, if the goal is to restrict the unilateral power of states, uh, or the exceptionalism that some states may resort to in the use of force with respect to other states. If that is the case, then maybe what we should think of is to think of the story, again, of Gulliver, uh, and think of having many Lilliputians come in with a thousand and one strings and try to tie down uh, this giant. And these many and many strings can take a variety of forms. One form could be the strengthening of the Security Council, notwithstanding the fact that, please bear in mind, the Security Council has never decided an instance being aggression. Security Council has never applied the definition of aggression which the Committee on Aggression worked on from 1952 to 1974. Uh, the General Assembly has adopted it by consensus, but it was not because there was genuine consensus. It's because no state wanted its name affixed to it specifically as saying we're in favor of it. Uh, being adopted by consensus sort of confutes all of the states present in it so that states can say, yes, we were in favor and we joined the consensus. But then when the occasion arises saying, well, we really joined the consensus. So you can see the different nuances of the benefit of, of consensus. But look at the practice of the Security Council. Um, I submit to you even a very small evidence. Do you know that to date, Neither the Security Council nor the Secretariat of the United Nations have ever made a complete catalog of all of the situations that have been presented to the Security Council pursuant to Chapter 7 to catalog the decisions and correlate the decisions to the facts. I mean, just a simple historic record. Larry, this uh, may be another book for you. Uh, just the historic record itself has never been fully compiled so that one can have a rather clear panorama uh, uh, of, of how the facts have been dealt with and what is the correlation between the facts and the law or the political conclusions uh, that have been taken. And so uh, this would be one avenue, of course, uh, strengthening the notions of state responsibility and creating a greater level uh, of, of uh, state responsibility in terms of civil responsibility might be another one. But the, the other one that, that we have sort of rather ignored is how do we reinforce national domestic system in order to make it more difficult for governments to resort to armed conflict? Uh, why do we look exclusively at international law as presumably the mechanism that will be able to have an influence on this type of decision making? Is it a valid assumption to say that by criminalizing aggression we will create a preventive deterrent effect on heads of states? I submit to you that it is totally utopian to think that there will ever be uh, a definition of aggression that will be of such a nature so as to provide a genuine deterring effect on heads of states and on major decision makers. Um, it, it might on occasion be applied, um, but as, as you well know, and again here we've had to shift gears to the criminal law, 
the theory of general deterrence requires uh, that the values underlying uh, the, 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 the social interests being protected are commonly shared in a given society, that there's a high level of opprobrium for it, there's a mechanism of enforcement, that it is likely the mechanism of enforcement shall be applied, and there's a fairly high certainty that that person will be prosecuted and eventually punished if found guilty. None of these exist uh, in the international arena, uh, and particularly when it comes to the responsibility of senior decision makers. So. To speak of it in terms of a deterrence and its prevention uh, without understanding the mechanisms of deterrence and prevention is merely a desideratum which we can express. So it has a symbolic value, uh, but we cannot expect much beyond the symbolic value. What we need to do instead is to look at a variety of other strategies. Let me give you an example. We have a number of international organizations today, which are multilateral organizations involving multilateral decision making, where economic and other sanctions may become extremely powerful and may operate as a much better deterrent. Um, the power of WTO and other uh, similar organizations uh, that, that may be drawn into a new international strategy uh, for international law using international law techniques and not, in a sense, trying to commingle domestic criminal law techniques with international law techniques in order to limit uh, the, the, the decision making of, uh, of, of heads of states and, and other senior officials in, in using armed conflict. So a whole strategy can be developed at the international law level uh, and I think that the moment we remove from that the picture, if you will, uh, or from, from that deck of cards, the notion of criminalization at the international level, we might make greater progress at the international level in order to enhance the modalities that will be effective on states or at least cause them a greater concern. Uh, simply put, uh, a cabinet is more likely to be able to tell a head of state, you know, uh, Madam President or Mr. President, doing that will have serious repercussions on our trade, our balance of trade, our finances, etc. cetera. Uh, that is something that a cabinet officer is more likely to be able to say, uh, rather than say, well, Madam President, have you thought of the possibility of being tried before an international criminal court? Um, it seems to me that this argument is much easier uh, to be dismissed. The domestic level is what we have not focused upon. In what way can we, in a sense, have a reverse impact? Rather than having national law impact on international law through general principles, how can we have international law impact on national law? How can we have the reverse process where national constitutions and the national legal order start incorporating some of these conceptions and make it more difficult at the domestic level? Neither one of these two strategies will necessarily achieve the desired result. Uh, and it is useful to symbolically have the definition of those most egregious cases where neither the international strategy will work nor the domestic strategy will work, and you have a blatant situation a la Hitler or a la Saddam Hussein invading Kuwait or others. Um, and and uh, there, there is no doubt that symbolically it's important to have that as an international crime, but it's also important to know that this is not what's going to make it work, that we need to have other modalities. I will conclude with just one, one cute story that I can't resist making, uh, particularly seeing Elizabeth Wilmhurst here. Um, in, in a prior incarnation, there was somebody like you, Elizabeth, who was a, a, a very uh, capable lawyer uh, in Whitehall. And uh, this was in 1919. Um, and the uh, um, peace conference was taking place at Versailles. And France was pushing very hard uh, to introduce the notion 
uh, of crimes against peace, or as we know it, aggression today. And they absolutely wanted to prosecute Kaiser Wilhelm II. Uh, and, of course, Great Britain was quite embarrassed. I mean, Kaiser Wilhelm II, after all, was the grandson of Queen Victoria. Uh, and, and a favorite grandson. In fact, when she died, he came over and he carried her from her deathbed to her casket. Uh, this is a little point of trivial history. Uh, and was very much involved in the organization of, of her funeral and whatnot. Uh, and so he was very close to the royal family in England, and, and the English people were very grateful to him for what he had done when his grandmother died. He was also, of course, the cousin of Tsar Nicholas of Russia. Uh, and since she had 12 children, uh, there were many other relatives, including uh, the, the Dutch royal family, where he ultimately sought refuge. And so the problem was, how do you satisfy France and the demands of other countries which have been victimized, but mostly the French and the Belgium wanted to, to prosecute the Kaiser. And so, uh, the, the, you know, the English are extremely sophisticated and wise in these affairs. And so this, this great lawyer came down from Whitehall and drafted Article 227 of the Treaty of Versailles, which said the following, that the Kaiser shall be tried uh, for uh, the the uh, supreme crime uh, of violating morality and the sanctity of treaties. Now, this looked very good on all of the front pages of the world. The Kaiser was going to be tried for violating the sanctity of international treaties and morality. Uh, it satisfied everybody. But as a legal technician, one would know that there isn't such a crime. And so when the Kaiser went, as I think you mentioned, and sought refuge in the Netherlands across the boundaries, um, and a group of people from the UK and France went and said, well, we would like to seek his extradition. And the Dutch says, well, what's the crime? And they said, well, this is the supreme crime against the sanctity of treaties. And they said, well, there ain't no such crime. And certainly, uh, if you use the principle of double criminality for extradition, there isn't such a crime uh, under Dutch law. So we cannot uh, extradite him. This is a political crime par excellence. Um, things, as I started to say, in law are not always what they appear to be. And I think we have to be very cautious in assessing uh, the realities of what aggression is about how it is to function, what goals it is to, to achieve, and whether or not we can start thinking out of the box for a completely different strategy to achieve our goal of restricting states in their use of armed force. Thank you. Well, I think we couldn't have asked for a better prologue for the panels that are about to begin. We have the voice of idealism and the voice of caution. Well, now for a moment of human rights, um, before we start the next panel, let's all take a five minute break. There are bathrooms on this floor, upstairs and down the hall, and let's come back promptly at 10 after so we can try to get things back on track. Thank you. <laughs>